Bestiality has finally been made illegal in Malta. A PN candidate has forgiven a priest who called her a Nazi and murderer online. And Parliament Speaker has hit back at Matthew Caruana Galizia after he called for his resignation. All this and more on Love and Daily. Good evening, Malta and Gozo. Jonathan Chile here, joined by Yannick Potch. Welcome to another edition of Love and Daily. We've had some interesting developments on some very important stories. We've got Yannick here to jump right into the first story. Yannick? Yeah, so uh, bestiality is uh, set to become a crime punishable by up to three years in prison. Uh, Justice Minister Edward Zambit Lewis uh, told Parliament yesterday. Uh, so the discussion about bestiality uh, became a hot topic um, last year when, when a, a, a St. Julian's farmer actually caught a, caught a man having uh, sex with his flock of sheep. We've had other stories uh, over the past past year and even before that. Uh, similar stories, you know, involving uh, people committing sexual acts on animals. Uh, now, while Malta's laws do ban animal abuse, um, there, there is no provision specific uh, to actually like, performing sexual acts. Um, so that is now about to change. Um, Parliament is currently discussing uh, changes to uh, a number of changes to the criminal code, including uh, these changes. So under the new laws, anyone found guilty of, of engaging in any sexual activities with animals will be liable to a prison term of up to three years, as well as a fine uh, of up to 6,000 euro. Um, if they're caught um, a second time, the, the, the fine goes up to 8,000 euro and they can even be banned from, from ever owning animals. The change follows multiple calls um, over the last year or so by opposition MPs, animal rights activists. In fact, uh, one of the most vocal proponents of, of outlawing the practice has been opposition MP Mario Gallia, uh, who last May in fact even urged Parliament um, to, update its, to, to update its laws and to impose a prison sentence and a 6,000 euro fine, um, as has actually happened now in the end. Uh, at the time, government was uh, reluctant, let's say, to implement the change, but it appears that uh, good sense has now prevailed and we finally have outlawed this, this, this practice. No, it's, this, this is definitely good news, this is great news. It is a bit insane that it took Malta until 2021, nearly 2022, to ban, you know, having sex with animals, um, abusing them sexually in a different manner of ways. Like Yannick said, you know, we had the case in St. Julian's, but this is just one of many cases that Malta's heard about over the years. There's probably many, many cases that we didn't even know about. I think in the case of St. Julian's, there was even discussion of whether it was a foreign person and whether foreign people were coming to Malta and some yeah. sort of illicit trade that was set up. So the fact that there's now fines, there's now, you know, possible jail time, that's, that's a really, really good sign. And it's really weird. When you look at Malta's legal framework, you'll find that there are these weird lacunas um, when it comes to very certain specific areas that finally it's good to see that they are taking on board and updating. But you know, talking about condemnable acts and moving on to the next story, um, a Maltese priest has been forgiven by a nationalist candidate after um, the Maltese priest had gone online and called the candidate a, sat a, a Satanist, a Nazi, a murderer, among many other adjectives over her pro-choice views. So obviously the candidate is Emma Portelli Bonici, who's been in the headlines for a few times over the last few weeks because of the backlash that she's gotten for her, her views um, when it comes to accepting abortion. Now, this priest, Father Andrew Borge, had gone online, and I'm, su I'm sure you've seen the post by now, but if you haven't, we have it on loveamalto.com, um, saved, where he basically you know, attacked her viciously, um, and, he, and I think he went a step too far by calling her a number of very hate-filled names. Um, she actually you know, made a police report, took it, escalated it, but she's now forgiven him for his acts. Um, and she, you know, she took to Facebook to say, quote, I like to take the time to remind everyone that the law is there to protect us. And as such, I encourage anyone who feels affronted to use their rights at law. No one should be mocked for accessing their rights at law when necessary. And no one should be discouraged from seeking legal protection. So, you know, this comes as Malta comes to grapple with online commentary, you know. A lot of people still don't realize that if you post something online attacking someone, attacking a politician, attacking Jeff Bezos, it could be who it is. If you are crossing a certain line, into hate speech, into death threats, you could be liable at court like the priest could have been. But now she has forgiven him, so it seems like this story has come to a relative end. Yeah, I mean, it's, it feels like we have to keep repeating this, but I mean, it goes without saying. If you're, if you're engaging with people online, there's no need to, 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 to make threats, there's no need to be disrespectful, you know, just 
express your opinion, express where you disagree, we can all um, get along uh, just fine without without being at each other's throats all the time. So let's let's, let's all give that a try, uh, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to our, our next story. Um, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Angelo Farrugia, has hit back at Matthew Kawana Galizia. Uh, after uh, last week, uh, he wrote a letter basically calling on him um, to resign for the sake of Malta's democracy. So as many of you probably know, um, last year there was a story about Labour and Pirozzi and Kutaya, who uh, received uh, money from a, from a property deal involving Jorgen Fenech, um, which he did not declare uh, to Parliament in her declaration of assets. Long story short, there was an investigation by the Standards Commissioner who did find that there was an ethics breach, um, and the Commissioner's report was has been being discussed by the Standards Committee uh, for the last couple of months, um, during which Labour MPs, uh, with the help of the Speaker, have uh, tried countless manoeuvres and have, have, have tried to delay proceedings in order to protect uh, Rosian Kotayar. In light of this, uh, Kamana Galizia wrote to Farruja last week, um, calling for his re resignation. Um, he told the Speaker, um, I, I quote, you have made an extraordinary effort to protect an MP who accepted a bribe from a person on track to be prosecuted for high-level corruption, a bribe to fuel the MP's campaign against justice for my mother. Uh, Farouj's decision um, to protect a corrupt MP, Kamana Garitia said, was a betrayal of his duty towards the country, for which he should uh, resign his post. Uh, the letter seems to have been sent last week, but uh, was made public uh, today, today, prompting uh, Farouja to publish uh, his response to Caruana Galizia, or basically to his lawyer, uh, Ian Reafala, who, I mean, it, it's worth pointing out, was originally one of the people selected to be on the public inquiry board, um, but who was eventually changed after you know, the, the family pointed out that, that he, he wasn't independent enough um, to sit on that board. But uh, basically, uh, his lawyer noted that according to parliamentary procedure, letters should not be ad addressed directly to the speaker, but should rather be addressed to the clerk of the house, uh, as though that makes any difference to the, to the contents of the actual letter. Uh, Farouj also referred to a libel case um, he had won against uh, Daphne Havana Galizia regarding allegations that you know, Farouj had harassed her and had uh, imprisoned her for attending a protest uh, many years ago. The speaker basically concluded saying he had no intention of resigning um, and rather than, in fact, he, he said that he, he insisted that he would be uh, remaining in place in the best interests of the country. You know, strong words from Matthew Caruana Galicia and, and arguably very, very appropriate and apt words. Um, however, the, the speaker's response is incredibly spicy. I was very, <laughs> you know, surprised to see Angelo Farouja using some of these words, bringing out words like vexatious. Um, as, you, as Yannick said himself, he said, you know, um, uh, this may all be, quote, attributable to a lack of knowledge of parliamentary practice on your part. Um, and as he, as he said, you know, he ended by referring to a case that Matthew's mother had brought against him um, that she had lost. So really, really strong hit back there. So um, I'll be interested to see, you know, if there's another response from the Caruana Galizias themselves. But moving on to the next story um, and talking about sentient creatures, um, you might have seen this in the UK news, but crabs, lobsters and octopus do feel pain, a new survey has found, leading the UK government to recognize lobsters and their crustacean friends as sentient beings. Now, this has led to a major discussion as far as restaurateurs and chefs. What should they do? Should they boil lobsters alive, like is currently the practice? Should they change it? Should they be killing them earlier? Um, La Vomota spoke to a, a number of um, uh, local chefs and restaurateurs. And if you're interested in the study, it was conducted by the London School of Economics. Very, very interesting. Um, and we spoke to a number of chefs and restaurateurs. Uh, for example, we spoke to Nicholas Diacono, best known from New York, best Fat Louis, and currently running the kitchen at Tico Tico, who said, you know, listen, I've never boiled lobsters uh, myself alive. It's always been a norm to kill them with a knife, plus the the fact that in Malta so many lobsters are flown in abroad from Scotland and Canada makes it even less attractive to him. Um, he's also made a point about how intelligent octopus are. At the same time, you know, he did admit that they are super tasty. So it is a bit of a, a back and forth in your head, right? You know, on one hand, you understand. I mean, we've seen documentaries recently about octopuses and how smart, intelligent they are. At the same time, especially in the Mediterranean, they are a major part of the diet, very common ingredient. Um, we spoke to Dial Grec from Burgers Inc. and Wagyu who said he's been cooking lobsters for years. In fact, some of his restaurants even have a, a lobster aquarium where you can choose your lobster. But he's always been a, against lobster boiling. And he said, once again, we kill them with the knife. However, he said there's other options. Apparently, you can freeze them for two minutes in the freezer, which puts them to sleep of a sort. And this is also an option if you want to not kill them with a knife. Uh, very, very, very interesting kind of reaction to this. Um, I don't know what you make of this. 
Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, you, you mentioned the, the documentary about the octopus, and I remember seeing it and actually thinking, well, wow, they probably should stop e eating octopus. Yeah. That being said, it is very tasty, as you said, so it's, uh, you, you, you kind of tend to bounce between one, one opinion and, and the other. With regards to the lobsters, I, I, I was under the impression that part of the reason um, that they're boiled is to kind of remove mm. uh, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. certain bacteria, it certain, certain viruses. Um, that being said, I guess, they're, in fact, killing them before might, might actually be an option to prevent uh, the, 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 this painful sort of uh, way of doing it. But I mean, it's not a clear cut, it's not a clear cut issue in my mind. And <laughs> to anyone watching this, if you cook lobster, you cook octopus yeah. or crabs, let us know in the comments below, you know, what do you do? Definitely. Do you buy them alive and kill them at home? Do you buy them ready dead? Do you buy them ready packaged? Um, I think, you know, this leads to a bigger discussion about yeah. how people should be approaching meat and fish. Yeah. I'm a meat eater myself. I haven't switched to veganism or vegetarianism. Either, but when you read these stories, you do start to wonder, you know, is that the obvious endpoint for this? But I think this is a, a discussion we held <laughs> over a glass of wine on a Friday night. <laughs> Definitely. Um, so on to our final story, again, we're talking about animals. Uh, Maltese wardens could uh, soon be equipped with, um, uh, equipped to scan dogs in the streets uh, to ensure that they are microchipped uh, in a bid to better control and understand Malta's dog population. As you know, you know, there are many stray animals in Malta, both dogs uh, and cats. Um, and so the issue came up as part of a discussion on Net TV's Until Vegan, uh, where host uh, Daryl Grima was speaking to Animal Welfare Commission Alison Bedzina um, and, and asked her basically whether it was time for wardens to be able to read, uh, be, be given chip readers to check pets on the streets. Um, Bedzina said that this would be, uh, happen, would be happening with the assistance of community police and the local council. And she basically explained that, you know, as things are, um, if a person has an unchipped dog, yeah, it's very difficult to find them. You know, I have to go to court and we all know how long that takes. And um, so it's, uh, the, the process isn't a simple one and doesn't really, doesn't really help uh, more than enforce the rule, which, I mean, under Maltese law, uh, all dogs um, must be microchipped and registered. Uh, so, I guess we might be seeing wardens, mm -hmm. uh, you know, being able to uh, stop people, check whether they're, whether they're microchipped or not, um, which I guess is a good thing at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's, it's fine for people to own dogs, but, you know, if there's a legal requirement, I don't see why we shouldn't be enforcing it. Absolutely. I mean, I think the idea that if there's a stray dog and a ward can go scan, maybe potentially find that it is chipped and yeah. find the owner, that's brilliant. I think one fear is, you know, the idea that you might be just taking your dog for a walk, a yeah. warden jumps out at you, is like, I'm going to scan your dog. Let's see if it's stolen. Let's see if it's not. I mean, that said, though, there's nothing to be afraid of there unless you're stealing dogs, I guess. Yeah. Um, so I think overall, this, is, this isn't a, a bad idea. And it's something that clearly the commissioner herself was very, very positive on. So I wonder if, and she said this is going to be happening with the help of the local police, as well as the community policing and local councils. This seems to be something that we'll be seeing in the coming months or maybe next year. So do expect to see wardens with a chip reader in the future, looking out to find out whether a stray is a stray, a lost dog, a stolen dog, or otherwise. Um, let us know in the comments below what you think of that. And I think this brings us to the end of today's episode. So as always, for myself and Yannick, have an evening full of love.